All right, welcome. Um, we are here to talk about Ms. Marvel, which is our one book, one college text. And it's exciting because this is actually part of our graphic novel symposium as well. So it's the first time we've able to been able to merge the one book, one college text with our graphic novel symposium. So we're thrilled to be able to talk about a graphic novel. Um, Ms. Marvel, uh, Meaning and Modern Storytelling is the name of our panel today. And I'm Tish Hayes, I'm one of the librarians here. Um, also one of the people who helps coordinate this exciting event. And uh, I have a, an amazing panel with me to talk about Ms. Marvel, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Then I'll give a brief overview and show you some images from Ms. Marvel, just in case you haven't had a chance to read it yourself. And then we'll dive into the book and really kind of take a look at what's going on there, why, we're, why we read graphic novels, and what we really like about Ms. Marvel particularly. So again, I'm Tish, I'm one of the librarians. Hi, my name is Sundas Madi McCarthy. I am an academic advisor here at Moraine and also the advisor of the Muslim Student Association. Hi everyone, my name is Bon al -Baidi. I'm a student here and a president of ASU Club. My name is Erica Deiters. I'm a composition instructor as well as creative writing and literature. Hi, I'm Carrie Millsap Spears and I teach composition and literature. Okay, to get us started, I'm just gonna whip through a few slides. Um, these are images taken directly from the graphic novel. Um, but I wanted to show you, maybe. All right, I'll do it this way. So I wanted to show you that when we meet Ms. Marvel, Technology, you guys, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, anyway, when we meet Ms. Marvel, she is hanging out with her friends before school at the local convenience store. We see Bruno and her friend Nakia. And she, we immediately know that she's having some conflicts because she is looking at this amazing, these amazing BLTs and, and wanting to eat them, but she doesn't. And decides not to because of her faith. So, and she's pretty comfortable, like this conversation's pretty chill with her friends. They're having a good time, and in Storm, the popular kids, um, and those popular kids want to invite them all to a party, and Kamala knows that she's not gonna be able to go, um, which she's pretty bummed about. And she kind of misses some of the microaggressions and the kind of uh, attitude that the popular kids are giving her and her friend Nakia. Um, so when she of goes home to talk to her parents, wants to, you know, again, go to this party, wants to be part of the cool kids, her father immediately is like, no way, you are not going to that party. Which is a pretty typical teenage experience. And her reaction, I think, is pretty typical too. She's super frustrated about not only not going to the party, but feeling like an outsider. And for her, it's specifically rooted in being a child of immigrants, um, being a Muslim American, and she just wants to be normal, or what she is thinking of as normal, right? So she sneaks out, which again, a normal activity for a teenager, goes to this party, and it's not nearly as fun as she is hoping it's gonna be. And the microaggressions that her, um, the other students were kind of throwing at her become much more active aggressions and they're not really being very nice. So she wanders off hoping to find a little peace and she is walking through this Terrigen mist. So if you are a Marvel nerd, you know what this is and it's exciting. If you're not, you don't need to know. It doesn't matter. It, you just need to know that this is the thing that is going to transform her life. So this Terrigen mist brings about her powers and she becomes the next Ms. Marvel. It's a character that she has always loved and wanted to be. And in her mind, the perfect Ms. Marvel is this beautiful blonde white girl. And so when she transforms, that's what she turns into. And as she discovers her powers throughout the book, she saves one of her classmates who had been mean to her, but she m made the decision to save her. Um, she starts to reflect on like why she's doing these actions, why it's important to her to be a superhero. And she realizes that being good isn't just a thing you are, but it's a thing you do. 
And this is a scene where she's taking her burkini and turning it into her Ms. Marvel costume. So she blends these identities that she's been having a really hard time coming to grips with into this amazing Ms. Marvel who goes on throughout the rest of the comic book to save the day in many ways, both for her friends and uh, the community that she's a part of. So that's a quick overview of how Ms. Marvel kind of came into her powers. And now I want to turn it over to the panel to talk a little bit at first about what it means to read a comic book and how it's different than reading text. Just looking at this final image that we've got, there's multiple text boxes. There's an image that fills the whole page. There's word bubbles. So what is that experience like when you are not necessarily used to reading comics? And what does that mean? So and anyone on the panel can, can jump in here. I'm probably one of the newest ones to comic book reading, so I'd love to answer that question only because this was a perfect slide um, that you picked. Um, because when I, when I look at that, I think I'm actually reading three different things. Mm -hmm. um, you're reading the bubble that she's actually kind of saying. You're reading her thoughts that are in the little box. But you can't forget to stop and just look at the picture. And I feel like that's a, that's a third thing that you just got to read because you got to sit there and absorb it. And, um, and it took me a while, being that this is probably one of the first comics I've read as an adult. And, um, and so I've, I've probably picked up ones as a kid, but never really thought about it in that way or thought about you know, what this all means. Um, so it, it took a while to train my mind um, to read three different things to get that, to take in everything that's in that picture. And, and when I first started reading it, I was like, oh, this will be a quick read. But if you read through it quickly, you're missing something. So you want to be able to stop and just look at the picture and take in what she's, what she's saying and what she's thinking while you're seeing that image. Sundas, I'm also new to, to reading comic books or graphic novels. I've read Persepolis a long time ago, and I peeked at Walking Dead when we had a zombie theme a couple years ago. Um, and to be honest, I didn't read it the way you did the first time. I literally read the text. Again, I teach lit, I teach writing, I read words. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't pay a lot of attention to the images right. um, until like the third read. I went back and read and then, then I could pay attention to the images. And, um, and it's still, uh, uh, it's not my favorite visual. It's not great art to me, I mean for me. <laughs> I, and it's just a different, or it's, I should say it's a different kind of art. And so the visuals weren't super appealing to me. There were a couple moments that stood out, some of the images, but most of them I just kept reading the text. But I think there's plenty of story in the dialogue and plenty of story in the thoughts too. Well, I'll just say a couple of things about that. Um, I don't know, Tish, do you have any images that kind of have the gutter line and then ones that don't have? Ooh, I cut most of those out. And that's no. one thing that when we look at it online, and that's the thing, when you look at the text online, we're reading it on Hoopla, because my classes are all reading the, this novel and we're looking at it on Hoopla because it's free and there's lots of copies of it and it's easy to get a hold of. One of the things you kind of miss is the sort of gutter line. So when there's white space, there's almost a stop. You're supposed to rest your eye mm -hmm. a little bit and take the next step down through the conversation. When there's not a space, sort of like in comics or in this kind of genre, this one thing that I, I learned by just going to a lot of these panels over the years and kind of, um, kind of teaching myself how to read them differently and why that artists make these choices, that sort of happens really quickly, like a decision is made, maybe. There's not a space, there's no stop, there's no pause. The images are layered on top of each other. And so you kind of see that on a few of the pages where things are very um, fast moving. And I think it's supposed to indicate time passage. And when she makes up her mind very quickly, for example, there's no pause, there's, no, there's, there's, no, there's not that white gutter line there. And so if you, and you can also tell because they tend to be panels and it tends to be either very typical, the way they're laid out, like one, two, three, four, or there'll be one complete page, or the page might go across two pages. And it's different when you read it in the physical form, I think, than when you look at the form, when you look at the digital one. Mm -hmm. Because the digital ones, when you hit the button, you know, and you, the next button, or if you're looking at it on my phone, like when you read it on my phone, or your phones, that's the way I think it's best, because you can see the whole page, 
pretty easily and then scroll up and down. And you can actually see some of that text, but on the, on the computer screens, I think it's a little bit different. But I think it, that matters too. So that kind of train, your eye kind of fills that in. So if you're reading a novel and things happen really quickly, you know what, either the dialogue speeds up or the um, tension raises in the room or something like that happens. But in the graphic novel world, sometimes it's the way the art is positioned. I think that's super cool. <laughs> uh, and again, I'm, I'm new to this and I'm not there yet. I don't have that kind of skill, I think, uh, or a habit in reading. Um, but just as you talked, I was thinking about poetry and reading poetry and how when I teach poetry, we're examining um, the, the structure of the poem, the, the, the white space, the stanza breaks, the line breaks, the short lines, the pace. Um, and of course, all of that is relevant. And I think artists, they make choices. Every time they make a choice, they're, 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 they're trying to say something. So the last um, panel, my class was here for the earlier one with the artist was on the Skype, and she was talking about how she you know, does her initial drawings and different things and the choices that she makes. And she has to make those choices separate from the woman who wrote the piece. They, weren't, they never met each other face to face. And so it's kind of interesting because they're actually two different texts that are kind of put together um, in a different place. And, I, and I, don't, I don't know how true that is for, for this um, illustrator and writer. I don't know if that's something that happened to them, but it is kind of interesting to think about. Well, for me, as a student and a teenager, um, I had experience with reading comic books a little bit. Um, but this one is different for me. Um, most of the time I read nonfiction books and those like you can't really relate to them. But this one is like a dream that like you think about it and it relates to me more than like a regular book. And with the pictures it shows more. A uh, regular book you just have to like read and then you're ma creating the image where this one is like giving to you. So it's kind of interesting hearing you guys like the first time reading a comic book. <laughs> Right, and I think like any kind of reading, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So like, if you're a lit major, like you spend like years and years kind of learning how to dig into texts. But same thing with graphic novels, the more you read them, the more you learn to interpret like what's happening and how all of those different positions are being used. Um, yeah, it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor, for sure. Um, I wanted to go back to Carrie and Erica a little bit because, I mean, thinking about first time readers of comics and knowing that both of you are using it in your classroom, like what is the response from students? Do you have a lot of students who are already comic book readers? Are you pe having students be resistant to reading a comic book? Just, I, I would love to hear a little bit about that experience teaching it. Well, I can kind of give you a couple of examples. So I teach a British literature um, one and two, and in Britlet one, we read um, the very long epic poem, Beowulf. Maybe you've heard of it before. <laughs> I don't want to be a spoiler, but there's like a dragon in it. Um, and I tried it one year by using a graphic novel version of Beowulf. I researched which would be the best one, which one is the most you know, significant in literary world. It's this one um, by Gregory Hines. And so I thought, oh, this is gonna be really great. This is gonna be awesome. It did not. <laughs> it was not. It, w it, it no, not <laughs> happening. The problem was the students were thinking we're taking British literature and it should be this very amazing, um, very hard, um, we must suffer, um, all this sort of idea. And this book is a lot different because the choice, we just talked about choices, the whole major battle scene of the first monster, there's not one word. It's all pictures. That part of the poem doesn't appear in this book. We had the whole poem in our textbook. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you can look at that section. We can compare it to these pictures. I said, well, why do you think that he would have made the choice to take away the poem and just put the pictures? This, this goes with my, what I just said about the movement of the page. Do you see how fast mm -hmm. this is? This is a fast battle. And then there are some places where there's no gutter line right here, like this one in particular, because he's getting beat up by Beowulf. Spoiler alert, he wins. <laughs> um, but the, there's a choice being made here. The, the creator of this comic obviously read the poem, didn't put the lines of the poem of that section in here on purpose, because honestly, 
if it's your first time reading Beowulf, the, the lines where, you, you know, the 200 lines or something of him beating up the first monster, it kind of slows down the story. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of punching and whatnot. And so so you have to kind of decide on that. So it didn't work well for that class. And I never attempted it in uh, British literature again until this semester. I don't, I guess I'm, I wish I'd try something. So I, um, we have these in our library. These are the giant collections of classics that are in graphic novel form. I actually brought this to my class which is The Wife of Bath by Geoffrey Chaucer, and we actually looked at some of this. And this actually did work better mm -hmm. because it was a little bit easier to understand what was going on because that book is in Middle English. Smart. So we looked at some of the pictures first, then we read some of the passages, then we went back. And I didn't have everybody buy this because obviously it's very expensive, but we just looked at it, passed it around, and we're a small class, and so it did work a little bit better. I've had much better success with Ms. Marvel in my composition classes. I did over the summer, and then all my classes this semester are using it. Everyone seems excited about it. We're writing profiles of the characters right now. Um, the honors classes here, they're actually gonna make board games um, based on, on the characters and the settings of the story. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very positive thing, but I mean, I think it can go well, and it can not. <laughs> I mean, it just depends. <laughs> So I don't know if that's a good enough answer, yeah, it's good. but it's real. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> Erica, you just had a class that talked about this. How did that go? Right, it was just last week. Um, yeah, so I teach, it, I brought the text into my COM 101 class, and this is a class where we're working on um, essays, developing our essays, uh, stating a thesis, giving support for the thesis, um, creating an engaging text. Um, it, in addition, um, to reading and writing essays, we've already read a series of letters, and we read and even wrote poems. In other words, we've considered a variety of genres, different kinds of texts communicating different kinds of ideas. And um, in the end, uh, that was the big discussion on Friday, which was that no matter what kind of text, there's a central idea. In an essay, it's called a thesis. In a story, it's called a theme. Um, and Cheryl Strayed, who's our, another author that we spend time with in the class, she says that for, for poetry, we're talking about the truth inside. What's the idea that, that the poet or the novelist is trying to communicate? And so we tried to weed out, in addition to dominant characteristics, for profiles of the characters, um, we weeded out some of the central topics and what what was the author trying to say about those topics, and again trying to make it relevant to my com class. You know, this is exactly what we need to do with our thesis statements or our thesis for an essay is make sure that we provide enough material for a reader so that they understand the thesis. I think my students were pretty cool. I think the first day that I mentioned what text we'd need for for class, I got a fist pump. You know, they were pretty psyched about it, um, or a cool. Um, and again, I think most of my students um, have spent far more time with comic books than I have. So since you mentioned themes, um, let, I think that's a good transition into like, let's start exploring some of the themes that are super relevant um, in Ms. Marvel and I think are relevant to us personally. And I'd love to um, get us started with Sundas and Bon talking a little bit about um, some of the themes that, th that really popped out to them as readers. Um, yeah, if you wanna go ahead and, and talk a little bit about what stood out to you and what you felt um, were important themes or themes that like felt really personal or relatable. Uh, I feel like I can talk about that all day. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to this book, um, like I said, it was the fr it's really my first comic. Um, I think the fact that she is a Pakistani Muslim really is what tied me in. And, um, and, and I wasn't sure what to expect at first, um, but the more I read and the more um, I saw these situations that she was getting herself into and how relevant it is to everything that we go through. And um, Bun and I talked a lot and she'll, she'll talk a little bit about the student perspective as well um, and what we both got out of that. But I think in, to 
today's day and age to have a Muslim character be Miss Marvel was just mind blowing. Um, and some of my students in Muslim Student Association saw me get a little too excited when Curious George went and had Ramadan, because um, <laughs> I, I was just through the roof when that happened, and then we, and then we get Miss Marvel. <laughs> um, so I think this has been really cool because um, we see a lot of like Muslim Arab discrimination and a lot of the things that are going on. And so um, when I was searching some things about, about the book, um, and just trying to find out a little bit more about it. I ran a across a, a blog um, that was from somebody who considered himself a recovering Muslim. I don't know if you saw that. Mm -hmm. and, and he was actually bashing Marvel for, for letting this book happen. And so it made me think even more so, um, G. Willow Wilson's fighting discrimination by writing this, and I think that that, that in itself should make everybody want to read it. Um, because things like this, these books, these writings, these artists that are out there do, doing this type of thing is um, they're, they're taking that, um, the misinformed and trying to take, you know, the Muslims out of that, that box that we're, we're being put into. Um, so I was really appreciative. Um, and then different things from the culture that just kept coming up that all of us that are in the culture can relate to um, it was just was just fantastic. Um, and then just looking at the two different things, when I talk about discrimination, there was a, there was a bad guy who kept referring her to the Bindi girl. And that, you know, and, um, and Pakistani is like the, the dot, you know, like the, you're the calling, basically calling her a dot head. Um, and so there's this discrimination part, but when she meets, um, when she meets, is it Captain Marvel, the, mm -hmm. the female? She comes and she says in Urdu, which is her language, um, we are faith and we speak in all languages of beauty and hardship. And she said something in Urdu, and, and so um, Kamala Khan says, you're, sp you're speaking, you know, you know Urdu? And, she, and so she said that piece, and I thought that was just so beautiful, mm -hmm. um, that yes, like every language is a language of beauty. Um, and so that, that's just another step where Kamala Khan as Miss Marvel finding and coming into her own was um, was starting to appreciate herself, and um, and so I, that's that's one of the things that I took away from it. And I'd like to I'd like to include Bon in this when we're talking about um, just the culture clash and how how those cultural things come into play. So do you want to share something? Yeah, um, where I grew up is uh, Lansing, which is like 15 minutes away, and the only Arab that I know are my family, basically. Um, I went to TF South, um, all American. I was the only Arab girl there. And the way she grew up is kind of similar to the way how I grew up, where when I asked my parents a simple question, if I can go to a sleepover, they would say no, because they don't know the family or uh, they have different religion based on what I have. So it's kind of similar when she asked them for the if I can go to the party and they said no. It's not because her parents didn't trust her or my parents didn't trust me, it's because they're like culture that we follow and religion that we have to follow. So it's, it's, it's similar. I think a lot of us grow up with that culture clash and Ben and I were talking because we, we kind of grew up the same. I grew up in an area that didn't have any Arab or Muslims and, um, and so it was a little different because you're you, you have to follow the rules that your house, you know, that the house has. And then when you go to school, you're like, yeah, I'm the only one that's requesting a beef hot dog whenever you, you know, like <laughs> you're, you have to put yourself out there. You're on blast all the time. Um, and so, you know, you find these uncomfortable moments. And so when she, when she has to switch over to the, the blonde that she feels a superhero should be, every time she was uncomfortable, she had to make herself somebody else. And I think we do that anyway. We do that, you know, when we get into these situations where we're in a different environment or we're in yeah. a new college. When yeah. you came here, you were a little shy at first, and then you found you found your friendships, yeah. and you and you became, Definitely. you know, like open. And um, so it was when she became um, more comfortable with herself and found that, okay, superhero understands me. So why can't I just be me? Um, and then she found it so exhausting to be somebody else, which is one of the things that she stated, and mm -hmm. um, was like, okay, that's, that's it. Let's, let's, you know, be who I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
in high school, I really, the first two years, I try to be someone else. And it is exhausting. It is, like, sad to try to be someone else. Um, last two years and coming here definitely opened, like, my eyes. Um, and the way that she knew herself, found herself, it's, it's amazing because you need to be yourself to be happy. You need to be yourself to be a good person. And the, th the fun thing with this is that their culture class doesn't, doesn't end for her. And, um, you know, even though she comes into her own, it goes from, you know, I need to be like, you know, the blonde people that I, that I meet or be this, this perfect, normal person. And then she became, becomes a superhero. So her new culture clash then becomes, okay, I'm, I'm Muslim by day and superhero by night, as opposed to I'm Muslim by day and I want to be you know, partying at night, um, which is, I thought, kind of cool, too, because it just shifts everything. But I think that's, as we get older, you know, and I don't know, I'm, I'm sure you guys, you know, are kind of finding that yourselves as you're getting into um, your college classes and finding yourself in other situations. We find those, those things that our, our dad said, our imam or sheikh or, you know, whoever, whatever cultural or religious figure that you listen to, like, start playing um, in your mind. And, um, you know, she refers back to so many things. She refers back to the Quran um, and things that her dad says um, when she finds herself in these situations. Uh, even, even the sheikh, when he, um, you know, talks to, and that's the basically like a Muslim priest, um, when she talks to him, he's like, you know, um, finally, finally he comes to understand and know that she's not going to listen. So she, he says, you know, when you, um, a student is ready, a, a teacher will appear. And so that's an old saying that we've, we've all heard and we can all relate to whether Muslim or not. Um, you know, so even some of the sayings throughout this entire book, you don't have, to, it's not just like relatable if you are Muslim. It's things that, you know, you probably reflect on as a student, as a person growing up, or even as I'm, I'm almost 40 and I'm like, oh yeah, that feels, that feels right, you know? Um, it's just a matter of just reminding yourself you get, you're doing what you can to be good um, and do good. That's one of the things that I think is so great about Ms. Marvel is that it is very, it's written that if you are a specific audience, specifically Muslim and growing up maybe in a non-Muslim area, like you have this really personal connection, but still it's a coming of age story that I think, I mean, if you've ever been a teenager, which we all have, like you know what it feels like to want to be someone else or to feel like an outsider sometimes. And I feel like it speaks to those experiences, again, whether you're Muslim or not. Um, but it also does this other great job of including and being inclusive of people that we don't necessarily see in comics that often. Um, before we move on though, uh, Carrie and Erica, do you have some themes that came up either in discussions in class or things that you really pulled out that you'd wanna, wanna share? Do you wanna go, go for uh, um, my, my students and I, we talked a lot about identity. Again, mm -hmm. finding mm -hmm. our true selves. Um, we had quotations from the book all over, all over the, the whiteboard. And um, I think you mentioned one of them, being someone else isn't liberating, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one, um, after she was shot, she at one point said, you know, I, I healed. As soon as I turned back to myself, my regular self, I healed. This is amazing. And so, again, looking at the fact that you need to be yourself to, to, to be strong. Um, I, I, again, this is because of perhaps some of my own faith issues and always ongoing all my life questioning um, religion and church. And um, so I was drawn to some of those moments. Um, also, uh, in, in the book, she, she questions the, the Muslim priest, I guess. Um, you know, he says something about the partition and modesty and dignity. And she's like, um, she said, what does she say? Um, but didn't you tell us there was no partition at the Prophet's Mosque in Medina? The men and women went through the same door and sat in the same room. And he said, yes, but those were blessed times. Um, and, and I just liked it again, that, that here's this young woman who's um, again, working through some of her own identity issues, some of her culture issues, and, and really looking at um, religious um, church faith issues too. Um, but then there were some other moments, again, with this religious connection. Um, it was a, a quotation from the Quran that she was remembering, whoever kills one person, it's as if he's killed all of mankind, and whoever saves one person, it's as if he saved all of mankind. 
think they're the right. Yeah. Um, and, and so there were a few, few of those moments that I was drawn to. And again, they actually tied really well to the book that we're using in my class. Um, and where Cheryl Strayed says that we need to be magnanimous. We need to be 10 times more magnanimous than we think we can be. So again, um, uh, like a great spirit, essentially. And uh, there was another moment um, where her parents had, she's, she's thinking through this, they've always taught me to think about the greater good, to defend people who can't defend themselves, even if it means putting yourself at risk. And, and I, I like and believe in those concepts. And so those were the, the moments that I was drawn to. Well, for my classes, we're actually doing character profiles. So we have, you know, an idea of taking the character out and kind of putting them under our magnifying glass and, and looking at them. And, and all the students had a choice of what character they wanted to profile. Um, and I find it really interesting that I'm getting a lot, I've seen, I've read drafts today, so I can tell you, I've read a lot of drafts about Bruno, <laughs> and he's kind of a very interesting character, and one of the thesis statements I've seen today, which I thought was great, um, that he's the epitome of a best friend, <laughs> and um, the idea that he's, he's the most awesomest best friend ever, and I think that that, he's a really great character, and he's very three-dimensional, and he's got a lot of, you know, great lines in the story, so um, that's one thing that we did look at, the different characters and how they kind of interact and how they can't, they're not, even if we're taking one out and looking at them, they still exist within the other, the other people are in their sphere, so. Yeah, one of the things that I love about this book is that those friendships, those relationships are central to how Kamala comes to, to terms with her own powers, so it's, not just her working through her identity issues alone, it's her you know, reflecting on the impact of her family, her faith, but then also her friends. And I feel like that to me is one of the things I love about all s like stories that incorporate those things I think are really powerful. Um, any other themes? No, okay. Um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure we talked about, and we've touched on this a little bit is um, just again, the value of having Ms. Marvel, who is a Muslim American, s Pakistani American girl, um, be a superhero. And how, you know, in the world of comic books, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's in the 80 plus percent of people who are writing comic books are men, mostly white men. Um, and a lot of comic superheroes were, were really accustomed to seeing like Superman and Batman and a bit those are kind of the traditional stories that we're used to. And Ms. Marvel is not only a really high profile book, um, she may be a character that's you know gonna be coming to movies soon. So like what what value is there and do we see in having these like really high profile pop culture um, images be a little bit more inclusive than they maybe have been in the past? Is that a question? <laughs> it is, I'm just I'm collecting my thoughts. Um, I, I just I applaud her. I applaud I applaud that. I, I mean, I, I you say that it's eighty percent male, but uh, so we have a female that's writing all these amazing books, right? Um, again, I have to go to you know she's just also getting a Muslim character in there, um, and she's the most she's a con Muslim convert mm -hmm. um, that's writing the book. Um, I keep thinking she's Kamala Khan. I keep, I'm like, I've been rumored. <laughs> <laughs> Troy's like, no, that's just the character. <laughs> um, but just, um, I, I just love it, just going against the grain. And we need to get ourselves out of the, the box of like these things don't happen. And girls can write graphic novels. And a Muslim girl can write a graphic novel. And a Muslim girl can be a superhero. Um, because I'd like to think when I'm looking at these themes, like we're all in some way like connected to her. We're all in some way superheroes because I see some of the things that some of our students do, and it just it's wonderful. It's seeing it's just mind blowing how much you know. Like even if you're reaching out with other, with to people around you, you're doing something. You're making a difference. Granted, not to the extreme where your hand is growing like so much bigger and you can pound out a, a bad guy, but um, but you guys have that power. Um, I really liked because I I read I read on. You know, I kept <laughs> reading past past the little part that we were supposed to do, um, but I love uh, um, when there was there's a moment where she does meet Wolverine, and I know she meets everybody else. I haven't gotten to meeting everybody yet, but um, 
but they're having a conversation and uh, Ms. Uh, the Wolverine says, you know, appreciate the power while you got it. The only power that's worth a snot is the power to get up after you fall down. And, and I loved that so much because I'm like, that's not, that's not just a, a superhero, that's, that's you guys, that's us, that's all of us. Like, we have to remind ourselves to have that power to get back up after we fall because there's so much things going on. I just love the themes in here because it's everything that we can re relate to in our lives. Um, in terms of that, I think I'm getting off, <laughs> off topic a little bit. Well, I can speak to the value of popular culture a little bit and yeah. how that might play out. Um, I, I, was, I, was, I went to Bowling Green State University over the summer. I earned a grant from the Popular Culture Association, and I actually got to research in their popular culture library, which is the largest popular culture library in the country. So I was a very happy person for about a week. <laughs> um, and so I was, very, I was engulfed in it and got to hear a little bit about and people argue about what is popular culture, and people argue about if you should call it pop culture or popular culture. People have a lot of different things they say. But what I'll say is the value of it is it's the culture of everyday life, meaning that these things are around us all the time. So we go out there to the and buy some comic books and whatever. We can go watch the comic book movies. They're, they're around us all, and it allows us to have easy conversations about harder topics. And I think that's the, one of the main things that popular culture can do. Also, popular culture can um, really kind of bring um, things into the mainstream that have been ignored. So um, my, my friends know me that I'm a big Star Trek nerd, and uh, Star Trek is huge with uh, breaking boundaries of things. The first interracial kiss, for example, was on Star Trek, the original series, and how that happened. And so these kinds of things are huge in mainstream culture. So you've got a show like Will and Grace, for example, that brought um, LGBT issues to the mainstream culture in a different way and then allowed for marriage equality and there's been a lot of research on that. And so, I mean, I think that popular culture, the value of it is absolutely so important to us that we, we sometimes I think we can just go and just blow it off like, oh, that's just for kids or whatever. Um, I've read a lot of graphic novels that are not for kids. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of value to it and there's a lot of um, depth to it too. One of the things that I love about um, Ms. Marvel being specifically Muslim is that um, as a, someone who grew up in a Christian culture and a Christian household and then kind of pushed religion away and kind of didn't engage at all, um, you know, looking at the way she brings her faith in, I think is a really, like it's a really positive portrayal of how you might um, interact with faith, uh, specifically um, Muslim faith. So um, I have one more slide that I threw in here. Maybe I opened it too up. And again, one of the powerful things about, I think, comic books is that, um, so when she's in the Terrigen Mist, um, she has this kind of hallucination right before she becomes Ms. Marvel, and she is so the like Captain Marvel or this vision of Ms. Marvel is in front of her speaking in Urdu, and it's quoting this um, poet. Ooh, and I had it written down. Sorry, y'all. Um, so it's a quote by a poem from a poem by Sufi musician, poet, and scholar Amir Kusro, uh, who is also known as the father of Urdu literature. Um, so this text that I would not have known otherwise and maybe not had pers have pursued otherwise, but it's beautiful and it's part of who she is and her culture and where she's coming from. And as someone who didn't have a lot of exposure to that, like to be able to see that and the beauty in that um, was really exciting. So I like, you know, it's nice that a comic, which is this kind of casual pop culture experience, also is bringing like beautiful literature and poetry mm -hmm. into my life that I otherwise wouldn't have seen. May I add to that? Yeah. Right. So this is later in the book, I think, where she she quotes um, who she says is Rumi, the mm -hmm. poet Rumi. Um, and it's it, this this place where you are right now, God circled on a map for you. And, and you know, as a lit person, I'm like, ooh, literary illusion. I got to check this out. You know, she's adding depth to the discussion to her comic book. And um, I... I 
I dug in and tried to find this poem by Rumi, but it, it turns out it sounds like it's a different poet, actually. Mm. Hafiz, who's H A F I Z, um, and they're they're both um, there. There's about a hundred years between of them, but they're both Persian. Um, is it Sufi, mystic poets? Um, so again, looking at uh, a person's connection to God, mm -hmm. that God can um, not just be heavenly, but also his presence is here on earth. Um, and, and I read the poem too, and it, it g again, the concept of the poem is beautiful. Again, going back to my religious mm -hmm. you know, themes and questioning, um, questioning faith, but um, may I read it? Or yes, please. Long? Okay, no, so it's it, again, the title is The Place Where You Are Now, and it's by Hafiz. And uh, this place where you are right now, God circled on a map for you. Wherever your eyes and arms and heart can move against the earth and the sky, the beloved has bowed there. Our beloved has bowed there knowing you were coming. I could tell you a priceless secret about your real worth, dear pilgrim, but any unkindness to yourself, any confusion about others will keep one from accepting the grace, that love, the sublime freedom, divine knowledge always offers you. Never mind, Hafiz, about the great requirements this path demands of the wayfarers. For your soul is too full of wine tonight to withhold the wondrous truth from this world. But because I'm so clever and generous, I've already clearly woven a resplendent lock of his tresses as remarkable truth, a gift in this poem for you. Again, I, the, the whole concept of, of being where we are, that's what, where we're meant to be. That, that stood out to me, too, just because mm -hmm. when she said that, like, it's a, it, won't, it was like a commitment she's making herself to go in there. Like, she's, she's got to prepare for this. Whatever she's walking into um, when she's confronting, I guess, the bad guy, and um, that was her way of just saying, all right, this is, this is it. This is where mm -hmm. I was meant to be. This is what I meant to do. Mm -hmm. And this I'm going to go do this. Yes. Yeah. 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 You can take a question. <laughs> Ooh. Um, do you have a question? Getting what? Chilled in Moscow. Like more of a kind of like portion of it in Marvel. Just want people to know that I think that's how you Ms. Marvel or Captain Marvel? Captain Marvel. Oh, well, there's a movie coming out, so I'm guessing that's why. I know first they do the um, I can't think of the correct people's job. I can't think of the last thing I turned on Marvel to do and it was SGW. Mm. SGW. Mm. Yeah. So it's like a job of career. Oh. That's that's um, a point that I think definitely is worth talking about. You're right. So Kamala Khan and many other characters in the Marvel Universe, like Black Panther, um, some other heroes who I can't think of right now, um, but that are, whether they're women or people of color or queer, um, Marvel's done a relatively good job for a mainstream media source of, of putting that representation out there. And there are definitely, there's definitely pushback from some of the mainstream readers um, about, really, do we need this much representation? Um, do any of you have thoughts on that? I mean, I certainly do, but I would love my panelists to <laughs> take well that I up. think representation matters. I mean, I, um, can I share what I just bought at the, uh, yeah. the yeah. outside? No, it's worth talking about. Yeah, yeah, Carrie. Well, um, when I was at the Popular Culture Library, I, I'm actually working on a piece on Batman because, well, not on Batman per se, but on the myth because Batman turns 80 this year. Um, and so I'm presenting at the National Popular Culture Conference. Anyhow, one of the things I learned was Batgirl and Oracle are these really interesting characters, but this representation of disability in the Batman universe with Oracle being in a wheelchair is kind of an interesting thing that you don't see a lot in, in mainstream comics. And when Batgirl is injured and she's in the, in the wheelchair um, after that situation, it gets complicated because all comics are complicated, right? Um, but 
I just think it matters. That representation matters. Seeing a character, a superhero character in a wheelchair is, is important. It makes people understand that there's a whole world of ability out there and it's just another way and just another way in and why popular culture has such value to people. And I just, I just really believe in it. And um, in my common one two class, I always, I use a slide that has a picture of Batgirl standing up from a wheelchair and it's actually from one of the comics and the caption is Batgirl triumphant. And the idea that, um, you know, ability and disability, there's a very interesting conversation there. And I think it's one that comics, you know, just allows us to have it because it's, you know, obviously we're not, I mean, unfortunately I'm not Batgirl, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but, you know, the <laughs> I mean, but, but the idea that we could all be something that we're not. And I think that this book, uh, Ms. Marvel, is all about transformation, you know, being something that we think we might not be, but allowing ourselves to be more than what we think we are or, you know, taking that risk. So I just know, I think it's important. I, I applaud them for it because, I mean, how many of us or how many people out there like me probably wouldn't have read a graphic novel otherwise mm -hmm. not being introduced to it this way. Yeah. So those differences, I mean, they're, maybe they're upsetting some people, <laughs> um, but, who, who else are they touching that they didn't touch before? And who right. else is benefiting from this? Everybody could, Everyone given an could open mind. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, everybody could, but uh, wow. I mean, there's so much that we can get out of these. You know, Black Panther blew my mind away. I, I watched, I didn't read it. I watched the movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the amazing. first one I'm reading. <laughs> um, but it's still a wonderful movie. Um, but I mean, I was just, I don't know, I, I just, I can't say how appreciative I am. The one, you guys brought this to the campus. Thank you guys, the, the library and mosaics and everything um, that, that helped to make this happen. But the fact that these are, these are happening, I mean, we should, we should know, we should, we should applaud these different, you know, graphic novelists, you know. Uh, yeah, two cents. Two cents. <laughs> All right, we are, um, we have a dwindling audience. Mm -hmm. I think classes have shifted. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we can maybe, let's wrap up with, I really do wanna hear people's recommendations, like reading Ms. Marvel. Um, is there something that you like, is there a, pers a person that you wanna recommend Ms. Marvel to, or is there something that if someone has read Ms. Marvel, you would recommend that they read next? I think either one of those would work. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> 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 I'm going to drop my mic. <laughs> Love it. Erica? Um, so I have a few. Um, this, again, not a graphic novel, comic book reader at all. My office mate is more so than I. This is actually her textbook that she uses. It's a memoir by Linda ba Berry, and you can see that it's, there's a ton of text, but it's also presented in graphics. And she has beautiful comparisons between writing and drawing, and that's obviously comes together really well in, a, in, in this memoir. Um, so my office mate talks about it all the time because she uses it all the time in class, and because I've been reading this one, my ears are kind of perked, and I'm like, I'm all over it. So I'm gonna read it, and from what I understand, it's amazing, so I do recommend it as well. And then um, I kept thinking of two authors as I read Miss Marvel, one of um, whom is a poet. I've mentioned poetry before. Her name's Naomi Shihab Nye. And she has um, a couple different uh, collections that I've used in classes. One of them is um, 19 Varieties of Gazelle. It was published in 2002. And a lot of what the poetry talks about is um, uh, Arab American connections, um, and she writes a lot about living in America, traveling to um, Calcutta, um, nope, that's wrong, um, Palestine. And then she also has Honeybee, which is a, a collection for more young adult readers. It's poetry and it's prose, and again, it talks about her, it, uh, the poems are very autobiographical, and her prose pieces are, are very autobiographical, and she writes about her experience as an American child with this heritage in Palestine. 
And then I also thought of um, Jhumpara Lahiri's um, short story collection, Interpreter of Maladies. She's the author of Namesake. Again, always dealing with first generation um, Americans, immigration, living in America, trying to blend in is not the word, that, um, but it's kind of their word, trying to fit in, trying to find themselves um, with, again, cultural identity. Those are my three. Nice. I love I love these stories. Love them. Um, well, I didn't bring books to recommend. That's fine. But uh, I do recommend Miss Marvel. The reason why I recommend it to people who are not Muslim or not Arab, so they would know more about our culture. Because being in high school, like I've been judged a, a lot being Muslim or Arab. So people like in high school who are not Arab or Muslim, you should read this. Then you will understand my culture. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. I like that Erica brought a book for all of us. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's just going to pass them out. Um, you know, before I say my little piece on Miss Marvel, I, I did want to squeeze in there that I really think Bruno has a crush on Camilla Khan. Um, <laughs> maybe a little bit. <laughs> 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 I said maybe a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if maybe if we keep reading on the whole Ooh. bit, we'll find <laughs> out. Um, but that's, that's just a tiny part of the whole story. Um, I, I would recommend this to just about everybody, um, but you know, just like she's going to be recommending it more so to non non Arabs or non Muslims, um, I think I'd want to I'd want to recommend this to anybody who's been in in our place, right? Yes. Um, growing up in a Muslim household, in a non Muslim environment, where all you have is culture clash left and right, and you have to kind of hold your own somehow. Um, and some, sometimes, you know, maybe getting picked on a little too much um, and how you address that and seeing who you, like, how you can come into your own. And, God, if a 16-year-old can find herself in Miss Marvel's shoes, uh, <laughs> you can certainly find a way to, to find your path and who you are um, and use those wonderful things that are a part of your faith to show that there's so much more than what they say about you. Thanks, all of those recommendations are amazing. Um, I'm excited to read them and recommend these. Um, do we have any questions? I know that there aren't a lot of people left, but <laughs> if anyone in the audience does have a question, be happy to answer it for you. All right, in that case, I um, want to say thank you, huge thanks to the panelists. Um, for those of you watching this video, please uh, go to Hoopla and download Ms. Marvel. It's amazing, it's worth your time, and it's free via the Hoopla app. All right, thanks.